Hey, my name is Dominique Nieves, and I created this Industry Insider Series so that we could pull back the curtain onto breaking into the industry. And I am thrilled right in time for Latinx Heritage Month to introduce our next guest. Please tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you for having me here. I'm Moises Zamora. I am the creator and executive producer of the upcoming uh, Selena series on Netflix. Flex. So yes, I know. I reacted like that when I found out that I was going to be attached to the project. <laughs> so very grateful for that. It's uh, been a very interesting sort of um, journey for me as a writer. Um, after I'm a Mexican immigrant. I got to the States from Mexico when I was 11 years old, worked my ass off, um, and um, ended up um, studying in the East Coast graduated. Um, during the, my time on, in college, I really realized I wanted to be a writer. Uh, let me close that window because I'm like right on Ocean no. Drive. Hold on a second. <laughs> this is a short commercial break. Selena, the series is coming to Netflix and you're back. <laughs> and I'm back live from Santa Monica. Um, and um, so I, during my college, I, I really had a lot of identity the issues I think and not only was it you know discovering my own sexuality but at the same time like as a Mexican-American with having those identities uh, come in terms with that and um, I also uh, my creative identity I really the first thing I did when I got to college was like take playwriting courses and uh, Polo Vogel at the time was there this is Brown University and so I just got enamored with the whole process and uh, but ultimately, you know, I didn't really love the theater crowd because they were so clicky. <laughs> there were a lot of New Yorkers that already had like grew like, you know, they grew up with New with the theater. So they were just like all over the place as far as that. So that was a little intimidating for me. So I ended up just writing um, just narrative form prose, creative writing. And I also discovered that at the time when I was going through a lot of changes as far as like getting to know who I was, my emotions, um, especially on my diary slash journal, would trigger the Spanish language to just sort of come up. Like just, I would just switch from English to Spanish without even realizing that, especially um, the more emotion I would get on the page. And so there, for me, that to me was kind of a sign of like, oh my gosh, I'm a writer, but on top of it, I need to write in Spanish. In retrospect, I think it was just, um, just the fear of uh, writing in English, because you know, being my second language and the whole immigrant experience, and you know, having to deal with discrimination and racism at a young age, and and just not, you know, you when you're brought here as a young, you know, little kid, like you know, that was not your choice, you know, and you had to leave all your loved ones behind, and um, so I, for some reason, I just, I guess, I decided that. Spanish language was um, the language for me to become a writer, to write. And um, I started writing. Um, also, Carlos Fuentes came and he was an associate professor. And so his story like influenced me. It's like, I had to be just like him. So uh, I just decided to, that I would write in Spanish. And, but I had a sixth grade education of that. So I had to teach myself how to do that. And um, I wrote a novel, I think, uh, around that time. Yeah, I think I finished around the time uh, before I graduated, and it was awful. Uh, lots of I made up a lot of Spanish words. Um, your grammar was crazy, and uh, but ultimately, like this, you know, I kept on working on it. I knew that it, everything the first time is kind of terrible, so it was the second novel that I wrote shortly after college because I moved to Paris to write the great Mexican novel in Spanish. Uh, I was enamored with the whole idea of being a writer, being bohemian, being creative, being like magical. And all the writers that I admired, like, lived in Paris at some point. So, of course, I had to go and live in Paris. And out of that, um, I wrote uh, a novel. And um, that particular one actually opened a lot of doors for me, or at least validated me as a writer. It got a couple of awards, and one being in Spain, the other one being in Mexico. Got a publication, a literary prize. And, you know, I, I was young enough to to be like really excited, really validated. I'm a writer, that's my life purpose, that's my meaning. And so um, by the time I had already had um, been back on the States and I was living in, in LA and um, they offered me a small book tour um, 
it's the Ministry of Culture in Mexico. So I'd have to, the only, they couldn't really fly I mean, they didn't have that money. So it's like, you have to live in Mexico City. So I, I moved to Mexico City for a year to do a book tour and it was magical, it was incredible. But I was also like broke as hell. Um, I was living off of oatmeal for like days. Like I know how to cook oatmeal in every single way, like fried oatmeal, um, you know, like anything with tapatio. It's just, it was, I can't stand oatmeal now. But uh, all that to say is that when I came back to the States, um, I really wanted to continue writing. My parents were like, okay, we get it. You're a writer. Okay. But just do something that could um, help you support your writing while you achieve that. And I had no choice. This, you know, I had really declared early on that this was my purpose, my, my meaning. And so um, I was going to do everything possible. I ended up working for an advertising agency for a few years. And it was Hispanic, uh, a Hispanic advertising agency. So uh, I did a lot of bilingual work. So I started from a translator, proofreader, and work myself to copywriter and then associate creative director. So in a way, like everyone was happy. Parents were, you know, they knew I was making money. I was actually, live, you know, making a living. But at the same time, I never stopped writing. You know, I kept writing novels. I kept writing plays. Um, and then being in LA, which is really wonderful, it's just, it's just surrounded by a lot of creative people and the entertainment business. At first, I wasn't really interested in the entertainment business. But since, um, you know, with theater and being in, like, again, uh, getting over the whole theater thing and starting to really love collaboration. And um, a friend of mine who was getting an MFA at, um, at USC in directing, he's like, well, can you help me produce this? Because, like, I don't want to depend on the other USC students. So I got involved in his short film thesis, and I really loved it. There was something in about producing and bringing this, cool, like, a huge group of people to create a beautiful story. And um, I was using my, you know, associate creative director skills from advertising and, and just, just, I just love the magic of a lot of people coming together to create something, you know, a story. It's just, it's just, it just I discovered that and I just really loved it. And so that's when I realized that I wanted to give a chance to, um, you know, screenwriting. Uh, and um, because I was getting a lot of USC students and people like the word got out. They really liked, you know, my work as a producer. They were asking me to produce their work. And before I took another step into another career, I wanted to like come in touch with what I really wanted, which is I'm a writer, I'm a creator, and that's what I need to do. So I took a lot of classes at UCLA at night, over the weekend, some workshops that I highly recommend if you're ever in LA. Script Anatomy is fantastic. Um, and through that, I wrote a pilot that a one hour drama that opened all the doors for me. And, uh, that pilot, um, got me my first manager who was Jewel Ross, um, who represents Barry Jenkins. And, um, then it eventually, you know, got me my first TV writing job, which was for John Reilly's American Crime. Uh, the third season, and uh, it was uh, you know it was it's a life changing experience, um, and of course like me getting that job on my own and through my own sort of like network, I actually the way I I got my stuff, my pilot and my background um, uh, in front of the ABC executives uh, was through a class. Um, Davy Perez, uh, one of the uh, Latino writers in that show, was uh, teaching a class independently um, about because he came through the um, the ABC Writing Fellowship program, and uh, he was teaching a class on how to be you know to prepare us you know for anyone to to if we're going to apply like you know write the pilot the spec like your bio it was a class for that. And as a result of that, um, he got to know me, he got to know my writing, he met, got to know my background, and he um, really liked it, was impressed, and submitted it to, without me knowing, he just told me like, hey, do you mind if I send this to ABC? He didn't tell me for what, and he had sent it to Michael McDonald, executive producer of American Crime. And it was, you know, they got it on a Friday, and on a Tuesday, they called me for an interview for the staff writing position, 
And on Thursday, I was interviewing with them. The next week, I was talking to John Reilly. And the following week, I had gotten the job. So it was... Overnight success, right? I, you know, it only <laughs> took 15 years. But <laughs> but it's, 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 I think that a lot of people, you know, and I wanted to talk about that, the overnight success is, uh, in retrospect, I actually had a lot more opportunities in the entertainment business to... Um, if I had taken them or if I had like walked through that door, I probably would have gotten a screenwriting opportunity, but I wasn't ready, you know, because I couldn't even see that that door opening up and I didn't even know what to do with that opportunity. And, and you kind of squander that if you don't have like your diverse portfolio, if you're not, don't know how to present yourself and sell yourself as a screenwriter, if you can't talk about like, like the specifics of your story or what you're, what you're passionate about, like, or what you actually want. A lot of people, you know, and, and now I experience it now and I, now I know why is, um, you know, they want to be everything and, and, and it, it's okay to be everything. And, you know, we have a lot of writer, directors, actors, creators, uh, but, but sometimes, you know, especially the person, you know, almost, you know, you're not, it's especially the, the person that, you know, suddenly has, interest in who you are and how, you know, you as a creator, you know, they want to help you. And you almost have to be prepared to say, this is how you can help me very specifically, very like that. We're like, okay, I can do that. I can connect you with this person. It's like, I want to be, uh, I want to be on a specific show for a specific genre. You know, if you want to get that, you know, uh, so specific when it comes to like what you want that way we can help you and we know how to help you if you want if you tell me you want to be everything it's really hard for me to help you <laughs> because it's like okay well, which one if you had a choice do you want to like get the opportunity for for an audition because that, that, that's one way to help or do you want to be in a room that's another sort of opportunity and that's another way to help so it's almost figuring out all of that and and you've done all these things because you've been a director, a producer, a writer. So I think I think they all help each other hand in hand. Um, and now well, you kind I of think, focused, right? I think I think that with um, with television and film, you do almost I mean, mostly with television. You get you have to wear a lot of hats. You know, you do you ha you do produce. You know, you become a producer now. A lot of the uh, show running um, sort of responsibilities I had, it's just really managing people and managing production and like crisis. And like, that's not creative, <laughs> that's corporate, you know? Um, and um, that's, those skills I actually didn't learn in a room. I learned them from my advertising years. I mean, I've done a lot of things here and there, but mostly out of necessity. For example, from, I, I, had, I did a documentary about young people in my hometown because I was yearning to find out like what would have happened if I would have stayed in a small town in Mexico. And, you know, if I wanted that to happen, I had to produce it, direct it. I had to like get involved in all of that because we're a small crew and we had like limited budgets. So of course you get to do, you get to wear a lot of hats, but I think I still have to go back to primarily, even though I'm doing a lot of things now, primarily I'm a writer. I've always be a writer, and once TV is done, I'm gonna go back to writing novels. And if, if I'm and if I'm if I can if and I can keep on mentally capable of writing, you know, I'll, I'll write some poetry after that. You know, so I absolutely I'm a storyteller, and um, this process in this industry is just another way of getting those stories out. You know, so um, that's uh, kind of a my journey in a nutshell. <laughs> that's a comprehensive intro. Thank you. You did like half my work. I'm like looking at my questions like, all right, that's done. The story of being an immigrant and maybe especially with your father in the medical field, did you ever get any pressure to like do something else and not be a writer? Or were they like, sure, go ahead and be a writer. And, and if they did push back, like how do you overcome that? Oh, I mean, I don't know what your experiences are, but I'm assuming that like it's really difficult to convince like Latino parents anything creatively they've always pushed back in the sense of like what are you doing they were they're mostly worried about like because they don't understand they, don't, they can't comprehend there's not a lot of people that have done it that they know that they have done it and so it's almost like well what does it mean to be a writer like you can't make any money you're always asking me for rent like what's happening you know like you went to this really expensive school 
and you're not making the money that you promised that you were going to make, you know? <laughs> so it's just, it's, it's a little difficult to explain why it's so important. And, you know, for those who, even though my dad is the medical field, like he was a doctor in Mexico, he's a PA here in, in the United States. So like, it's not like he was making a lot of money also in Central Valley. So there's also like a limited kind of resources, you know, and especially, you know, we weren't, like you know working middle class like ever like at some point like we did have we had it we had it rough i was cleaning houses with my parents you know to like get by so it's one of those things that like the stakes are higher where like okay you're choosing a career that it's not guaranteed there's no degree there's no like place that you go to it's really hard to make it in hollywood i mean the numbers don't lie it's we're not that many <laughs> especially latinx peeps you know we're just not i mean the WGA is like 3%, you know, and not all of us are working, you know, so um, the number, it's just, it's impossible. It's easier to get a medical school, right? So I, and I actually did try, I did, you know, I really loved um, the research, medical research aspect of it. I just couldn't handle like patients. And I thought like I was going to actually go into biology and research when I came into Brown. But as soon as I got there, I was like, nope, changing my changing my mind and I changed my major. I actually, you know, international relations did help because it had exposed me to a different variety of departments so in a way that helped me down the road. If I would have been like an English major, probably not, I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's just with my parents, it never really, I kind I mean, I poor, you know, poor immigrant parents. Like it, I kind of did what I wanted to do because like, <laughs> um, and then, you know, when I was in trouble, of course, I asked, asked them for help, but it was, I, I just, it, it, I had to do it. I, I had no other choice and, and I had to prove it. And, and you know, I was in, it, I also like had worked in the most randomest jobs ever to, you know, be able to do what I do now. But uh, I think it's just, um, you know, you keep on it, you are determined and, once they see what well, I think the first time is when they saw that book, they were like, okay, got it. And not just that, I'm being like awarded a literary prize from our home country. You know, it's like, we get it. Okay, got it. Perfect. Okay. But, you know, the financial aspect is always a big deal, right? Like, but you still can't live off of this. So, <laughs> you know, and it, when, when that turned around was, of course, when I was on American crime and they saw my name and then I was making a little bit more money. And, uh, and they probably it, told everybody, right? Like, look, look. And they told everybody. <laughs> now, now it's, now it's a huge deal because <laughs> American crime, even though they saw it, it wasn't a ratings hit. And it's not like everyone was talking about it. Now the Selena thing is now it's a big deal, you know, for them, for our community, for everyone and it's interesting because like at first they were like um you, you know you're i don't know if you're like you know your siblings or whatever like depending on how well you do it the more power you have in the family and i didn't have a lot of power for a long time um and they were like no we're not gonna listen to you no no you know but like now like i have all the power for some reason <laughs> suddenly i became yoda and everyone's like let's talk to moses and what he thinks about the most randomest things i'm like i'm a tv writer i don't know i'm not a psychologist I can't figure you out you know like go talk to professionals so um it's it's been sort of wonderful and now they absolutely get it and they support it of course that's such a relatable story it's funny rami you know he has the hulu show he recently posted and it was like a video of like his grandfather holding his emmy and the, and the grandfather's like the Emmy's nice, but it's just yeah, like this. And I was like, yeah. Rami, are you sure you're not Puerto Rican? Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's something that I think a lot of us really go through. So I really appreciate you, you know, sharing. And you know, it's, 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 and I love that though. I love that about, you know, Latino parents, how like they're pushing their children towards education because from one generation to the other, like uh, huge changes and leaps of, you know, or, or at, at progress and advancement. It's like in, in education, it's, it's always like the place that it's like tangible, you know, get educated so you can do better, better than, you know, maybe your parents, you know? So I don't blame him for them. I understand. <laughs> so you talk about creating this experience for yourself, like just going head 
first because you said, I have to do this. And so a little bit about what I know about your journey is that that's kind of how you got to where you are now. I know you're not an overnight success, but really you just had your written by like two years ago. So that, that does feel like a very fast trajectory to showrunner. So tell us a little bit about how you went from staff writer to showrunner. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I think that you, you, it depends on your personality, right? And a lot of, my personality is I've never been complacent about what I have because it can be taken away or opportunities come like, you know, for us, not very often. And so I've always been very grateful for what I have, but at the same time, how do I not only keep improving my craft? So I am a better writer and I'm always like learning. I am, I love taking classes. In fact, I just finished a class. So like my trajectory does not stop just because I made it to a specific level. I always want to know more tools, more, more sort of skills. Like I'm, I love learning. I love taking classes. I take, I took three classes this year after I done with Selena, you know, like it just, in, even sometimes the stuff that like I already know, and it's like the basics, it's such a good reminder, especially because, um, because like, Sometimes with, especially, you know, Selena in particular, it's a story that we already know. We had to work with a family. Like you don't have, I don't want to say a hundred, you don't have a hundred percent, you know, creative control. There's a lot of people that have inputs and a lot of TV is like that too. Um, but, you know, and suddenly you get kind of, you forget the basics, you know, you forget the, like, you have to have some sort of growth or just character driven, deep wounds, you know, all of that stuff that you learn you kind of forget it in like a class, even though it's just sort of a reminder of the basics, it's like always kind of like cleans my slate, you know? So, and also like keeps adding to the skill. And for the overnight success that you're talking about, um, it came about um, n realizing that even though I was very grateful to have gotten, you know, um, staffed in American crime, and then staffed again on Star or Lee Daniels. Uh, it was gonna be a third time that my agents wanted me to repeat staff writer level. And I, you know, I'm very well informed. I network, I talk to people and, you know, I ask questions, I ask for advice. A lot of, you know, you hear those stories of like, oh my God, I'm like my fourth year of like repeating staff, staff writer level. And that happens very often with people of color, writers of color. And so I'm like, I don't want to be stuck in that limbo. Uh, what can I do to get out of that particular sort of like, you know, uh, just, I guess, curse, you know, that, you know, or in this case, it would be systemic racism. But, um, but it, it was a reality, right? This is, I'm trying to take on this monster, but how can I make myself more valuable in a way? And, and IP. You know, uh, the way I got Selena was because I had already, as a writer, myself on my own, acquired uh, life rights to different kind of interesting uh, people. One of them being the world's youngest psychologist, which is Mexican girl who, like, a 13-year-old, like, has a psychology degree and um, learned, you know, learned how to read and write at three years old. Like, I, like I, I'm basically a Mexican Doogie Howser. You know, so I reached out, I talked to the family, I talked, they talk, turned out to be really interesting people. They have three geniuses in the family. They have a center for geniuses kids. Her so Latinx was, parents were like working on overdrive, right? Oh, I mean like <laughs> crazy. So, and now like, I think she, she's going to gra Harvard graduate school. She entered Harvard graduate school at 17 years old, which hasn't happened in a hundred years. So she's like this incredible human being. And I got the life rights to produce a TV show and, um, or a movie or whatever, right? And so once CAA saw that, because I, I got read by CAA after American Crime, um, they started treating me differently. They started treating me as a producer creator because uh, I was doing all that work uh, that usually producers do, whatever. And I was actually uh, pitching, soft pitching already to people that were interested in something like that, you know? And when they saw that, they suddenly put me in a different place, in a different category, and they weren't really pushing staffing anymore. They were pushing development. So they put me in front of Campanario, who had the rights for Selena, 
And it was basically like a call, hey, like there's, you know, you're doing so well over here. How about, you know, you talk to these people about Selena. They haven't really found the writer they've tried and they haven't really found, the, you know, the perfect match. And maybe, you know, it sounds like you may be, may be good for them. And I first I thought it was Selena Gomez. They were like, Selena. And I'm like, okay, Selena Gomez, okay, YA, all right. Not my favorite singer, but I can't, I can do something. I can't, you know. So, um, but then I was, they told me it was, no, it was Lena Quintanilla, the Tejano, like, star. They're, they had the rights of the family, blah, blah, blah. And it's, of course, like, I was, had a, like, mini, you know, scream inside my heart. Because, of course, I grew up with, you know, looking up to her. And she was, when I was in high school, she passed away. And then, like, it was a huge thing. And. So now that you are on top and you were staffing writers yourself, what are the type of things that stick out in the samples for you that make you say, okay, this person is in the pile that I have to interview them? Sometimes the samples, um, I mean, they offered a lot of things. It's very diverse when you read. And, you know, and it's really difficult to sort of like, is this person really good at outlining? You know, because at this point I'm looking for like, you know, uh, for my next room, I'm probably going to have a different process. Uh, of course, I'm going to read the samples and all of that because you need to s sort of see and hear their voices. Um, but I am looking for people with superpowers in at least one or two areas. Like, who is, is that person that just can get an outline? Like, that's their jam, you know? Who is the uh, the person that can deliver those goddamn jokes that like I sometimes can't. I mean, maybe like it can be funny, but like on the page is a whole different story, you know? It's like, so I'm looking for those kind of people because um, again, I, if I'm lacking on something, um, I'm gonna try to find that person that can help me with that. For example, one of my writers is Aaron, was one of my writers is Aaron Serna. And he's, he's, a, he's, he's half hour, he's comedy, you know? And because, because he's half hour and comedy and also he was from texas so like i needed to get people from texas and we needed to have a light-hearted slash humor into our right like he was the go-to guy for that and i needed him for that you know um hiring younger voices uh because you know i'm not 19 anymore you know like <laughs> and of course like I just had that kind of spirit, you know. Um, my 19 year old was, a, you know, Moise Tessamar was a whole, lived different than what 19 year olds are now. Like, just so we can have a little bit, I know it's, and Selena was late 80s, early 90s, but like, we still have a need to have a little contemporary sort of feel to it. So that way people can relate to it. So it's like, it's almost like putting the puzzle pieces together. And one of the things that is really, really important to me is. How do you come across in an interview? Um, I am a very, I like to say that I'm a very good uh, judge of character. And there was one particular writer that I interviewed, everything great on paper, everything great in the interview too. But there was a couple of things that just felt really wrong that were expressed in a very kind of like um, almost entitled um kind of aspect i'm not saying that to come in like you know humble you know humble but it's just like it it, it felt really kind of mm. and sometimes since we don't have a lot of time to get to know you um we don't know how we're gonna work out in the room it's also it can be already emotional because it's be selena so it's like i really want people that really care about that but at the same time that like we're gonna get emotional you know and I just want to, for me, it was very important to create a very safe space. Um, it, you know, the, when I, and especially in the John Reilly room, it, it was safe, nurturing, like all the pitches were considered. And so to me, that, that, that was really important. And I want to make sure that the right people were in there. Like most of the room, like I hired were mostly like recommendations. I think there was only two writers that came directly from the agencies um you know so it was like because you want to know hey you know this person and blah, blah blah so it's important to sort of have that network this is really important that you guys are in a class because you eventually will hire each other or speak about each other 
um, and their, each other's work. So the things that I think I try to sort of um, speak about with other creators and showrunners, especially uh, people of color, is that we are always um, judged by our achievements. Like we have to be freaking perfect in order for people to consider us. And I'm trying to get people to hire on the basis of potential, on the basis of like, look what they've done so far. They are capable of doing more if you give them the opportunity. And that's really, really important. And that's how I actually judge everyone. And so just want to create more opportunities for people. Again, because we rise together, right? That was so heartwarming. I feel I can see everyone's faces are like mine. We're just like, oh. As a, you know, as a showrunner, what is something that you loved about it that you weren't expecting and something that you were like, ah, I, you know, you wish you didn't have to do so much? I think what I loved, and I think it's just the magic of creating things with people, you know, like it's just, um, I really value writers so, so, so much. And, you know, through the showrunner training program, I learned that a lot of showrunners, um, are very quick to fire, very quick to get rid of. Um, and, you know, we had some challenges in our writer's room. Not everyone was, like, again, everyone is at different places. And I, we had um, a challenge with a couple of writers, one of them in particular. The outlines were not coming in in the right tone. The just were not there. And um, I came, you know, I talked to my upper levels, and I was like, look, this is an all Latinx writer's room, you know? If we need to take, it's going to be a little bit of work, a little bit of extra work, but we need to take the time to be able to prepare this individual or allow this individual to learn. And um, so we can set them up for success and give them the opportunity, like give them feedback, be like, this is what's happening, but all cool. We're going to put you in a situation where you can learn more and improve on that. And because if they go out there into the world after Selena, I want, them, I want them to not only be grateful because we, you know, we took the time and opportunity and we slowed down to empower and give that writer what they need to be better, um, but also because, you know, if their success is our success. We, we all, like, I don't, you know, it's already hard for us. Like, everyone's looking for us for us to make mistakes. And everyone was looking for an excuse not to give us a second chance. And I didn't want that to happen to that writer. And that to me, and having that close relationship with, the, with those writers to empower them to create, to make them better, um, of course, to get the work done and get Selena be an incredible story, but to also be better. Like you not only have friends forever, but you also are creating a community that will rise with you. And you know, you don't ever know if I have to go back to that individual to ask for a job later, you know, everything kind of gets, can get crazy. And that has happened in life where like the people that treat you bad suddenly are like showing up on my door asking for that opportunity and be like, oh, sorry, boo. Um, let me, I have a list here. Oh, yep. You're in it. Bye. You know, because you don't want to work with those individuals and you're, your reputation, your character is, you know, it's everything in this town. So to me, that was wonderful. Selena is a really inspiring role model. Do you feel that Latinx communities, Latinx narratives uh, in media are changing as a result of that? Right now we're in trouble because a lot of Latinx stories are being canceled and like taken off air. Um, I am hoping that this particular show does sort of open, um, people's eyes and minds to a family achieving the American dream. It's, uh, you know, the show was designed for everyone to enjoy. It's going to, you know, for kids to grandma. So it's going to be this sort of like, oh, and it would probably would have done amazingly on broadcast, to be honest with you, you know, because it's got all of those elements. And Selena herself was like wholesome and incredible and sweet and generous and compassionate and all of those things. And I was like, at first I'm like, is she, was she really, you know? And then like after interviews and all the research that I did, I was like, yeah, she was great. <laughs> She's amazing. Like, so it makes it difficult. Like, well, how are we going to make her like flawed, you know, like for, for the show. Um, and I think, it, I think it's a, the social reckoning happening right now. It's like all coming together. So hopefully we can hold accountable those like, you know, studio heads that are making those decisions. 
But I think I think Selena, since the way since the day was announced, has proven that appetite, not just for her, but just for those authentic Latinx stories that are abundant and that we still can tell and that are specific and incredible. So it's like it like again like the press and like everyone like realizing like oh my gosh why does selena like you know like a, they're a little too late to the to the game and and i i have if you know my career has dramatically changed you know and and the the press hasn't even begun you know so and i'm already like oh what am i gonna do i don't want yolanda's to show up at my door you know <laughs> but you know i think it's part of the responsibility that if it allows me to um, create, put together, like, you know, more stories out there that are Latinx. Um, you know, and Selena, again, I'm always trying to do what's more, what's the next thing. I decided that after Selena, I'm no longer going to be a writer for hire. So I'm not going to be a showrunner for anybody's show. I decided to start my own production company. And if I'm going to only, I'm only going to show run la authentic Latinx stories which means indigenous, Afro-Latin, and uh, people of Latin American descent. And with a you know, global commercial appeal. And if they want me, they're gonna have to co-produce with me and we're gonna make these shows only. So, um, you know, cause I, now that like they want me to show around all these other things and I'm like, nope, not interested. I'm building my own opportunities. Like I don't wanna knock on anybody's door. I want people to come in through my doors so we can create a lot of Latinx content. So we can actually build our own opportunities. The, um, what I'm kind of encountering, even at a quote unquote liberal university I am, I'm still um, getting a lot of pushback on when I put Spanish in my scripts, untranslated Spanish specifically. Mm -hmm. And um, it's not necessarily about that spe specific thing, but I'm wondering when you have to fight those kind of battles, uh, what's your your kind of mode, modus or, or and, uh, what's the technique you use to stand up for yourself while still making um, allowances where they need to be? Well, I think, you know, um, you have to, it, it just all depends who is the person and what you need from them. <laughs> Do you need them to green light your show? Can you, how much Spanish can you get away with it? I actually, and I'll use two examples. One, um, the, um, the Fox pilot that I, I sold and I developed, it does have a little bit of Spanish here and there because it's about a Mexican American family and, and it's relevant. And they didn't push back, you know, but I do understand what you mean. And one of the things that you could always sort of come back to and not just as like, because you almost kind of have to justify and defend yourself in a different way. It's like, well, look, you know, Netflix has opened the door to 190 countries of content. Now we're consuming content from other places. America and the newer generations are getting used to watching subtitles, you know, if not like dubbing in general. So having Spanish in, um, you know, uh, in, in the scripts or in, in, in partial Spanish, like it shouldn't be a big deal because it's, it's actually opening it up your market. You know, now you can speak to Latin America and all the Spanish language. So if you put it in like, if you go business on them, <laughs> they'll kind of be like, eh. you know, and also without calling them out like, you know what, it's not for you and it's okay. You know, um, but there is a huge community that like lives in this world. But in a way, like that could get you in trouble because you might be calling them racist, you know, or like you don't get me. And it's exactly what's happening. But um, you just have to figure out other creative ways to make your point. And another thing when it comes to structure, if they come back and be like, well, I don't understand what they're saying, but, you know, and always bring it back to like, well, is it because you don't know what the intention of the character is and you need it for their arc? Well, here it is the intention right here in this scene. So you don't really need to know the Spanish because that adds to the intention. Just make sure that what, that you always go back to the creative structure and the elements of what you're trying to achieve. If they're giving you feedback, then maybe the note is, we don't know the intentions of the character, the scene or whatever. And then you address that either by showing it on the page in descriptive by like having dialogue that actually addresses that note, but never bring up the whole Spanish. You know, like if this is what you need to know to get the character moving, here it is. Can we just not talk about the Spanish? Well, like not in those words, but you know, you kind of like, okay, bring him back to the actual structure. 
We are so, so excited. We're so excited to see what's coming from you and your new production company. We can't wait to see Selena in this series. And so thank you so much. I think we're all looking forward to working with you one day. <laughs>